can you hear us now? Let's see, let's check. All right, Cody Clemens, how are you? You able to hear us now, Amanda? Let's huh? see, let's see. I can't see anything, just black screen. All right. All right, let's see. Uh, all yes. right, there's Amanda. All right. So well, Amanda, I don't know you what the hell. Us and hear us. There's Melanie Parker. That's awesome. Yep, Cassie Mingle. Awesome. There you go. All right. Awesome. We did it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Touchdown. Well, and we got some blue moon. Hey, Cody Clemens. Blue moon mango wheats today. Happy hour. It's a real estate happy, happy hour. Happy hour. All, All right. right. Well, so, uh, hey, hit the gym for the first time. Yeah. So call your call your working out. Yeah, big time. And I tell you what, I mean, I went at five thirty, thinking that hey, I'm gonna be the only one in the place. Man, you wouldn't believe. Yeah, it's packed in it. Place is packed, especially in January. Now January is the. Uh, is the time to, to, to get those resolutions in. So I, I know gyms are loaded in January. I mean, you know how it is. I mean, I'm going to last at least three weeks. You got to uh, go at least three. The early morning. But I couldn't realize, I mean, it was tough getting up that next time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wow. And the worst part is, I'm telling you, man, these people are happy at that hour. I do not. Uh, I love you too, Cody. You're a great man. Great American. Uh, anyway, I just can't believe how happy you can be at 530. And then, like, I'm over there struggling, and here comes old some people we know and wanting to talk, and I'm like, I'm about to pass out. Uh, this ain't chat <laughs> Yeah, time. half of it. Half of it is the motivation and the energy just to get in there every day. Absolutely. Every morning. So next time you see me, uh, next week, I'm, you, you're not even going to recognize this, you know. That physique. This, this mass. That physique. I that know. I'm going to ask over this stuff. Yeah, and I, I've been doing a little bit of the on the exercise bike. At the the house. Peloton. Yeah, been been getting that in, and uh, um, it's it's been tough. Couple first couple of yeah, the first, Peloton. Now now hold on for all you people that don't know, this is at his house, and he's basically what it, it's Bluetooth, and you got the screen, and what you you talk about it. Uh, what what happens? You, yeah, yeah. Well, I just plug into uh, other other classes and uh, just ride along with the with the with the teacher. But it's a it's a good thing. It's a good thing, and uh, it's a good workout. Well, good, good, yeah. good, good. Well, actually, I think you're actually getting the workout. I, I'm over there just about to die. Yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, so the uh, you don't get this sexy, you know. Uh, the kids are the kids out. are doing good now. We're trying to get as many views on here as Collier's daughter Julia, which is uh, yeah. She got five thousand yeah. this week on Instagram. I think, I think she's beating us. So hopefully, uh, in a video, we can get some folks Nathan in there. Davis ben Stuy's checking in. Yeah, look at Nathan Davis. Had catfish with him this morning. Breakfast of champions. There you uh, go. Good stuff. There you go. Ice cream warehouse. Uh, great guy. Good. Good. Um, well, listen, man. I wanted to. Uh, I want to. Want to go ahead and dive in. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We were going to talk about your kids. You're not going to talk about the kids. Oh yeah. Okay. So so Taylor is in Boston. She is. Uh, Studying film and communication in, at Boston University. She's loving it and having a great time. And Brady is a uh, freshman at Spain Park High School. He has really picked up the, uh, the drive to work out and exercise. So he comes over uh, and, and we, we, we lift weights three, three times a week. So uh, he probably does more of the weight lifting than I do. But I'll jump yeah. in there and, and, and do what I need to. But uh, six thousand views. Sorry, uh, Julia. Sorry about that. We'll. Uh, he said something. That's fine. That's good. That's good. So anyway, let's jump into it. Today we're going to talk about interest rates. We yep. got a lot going on. They um, are. We've got a big secret to reveal. Big industry secret to reveal. We're gonna. Um, we're gonna get up to that. We're also talking about um, home buyers strengthen their offers. Yep. And then yep. we're gonna get into some questions. Um, some interesting hey, facts Lisa. I found this week. Um, where's the happy hour? Oh, oh my gosh! Yeah. Sorry, 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 Lisa. There you go. Um, and then we're going to talk about some uh, Southwest Airlines companion passes, uh, yeah, and things like that. But let's kick it off with 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 uh, the big reveal, the industry secret. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't really know how to say this, but I, you know, maybe I'll whisper it. Interest rates are going up. Oh. I don't know if y'all heard all of that. Up. Yeah, interest rates are going up. Uh, listen, we've been waiting on this for years, right? How many years have I said they're going up? Ten. This year? Yeah, like we have not had very little movement on interest rates in the last very uh, eight to ten years since two thousand seven eight when we had the crisis. Um, and you know, right now, what I'm reading, and I spent a lot of time reading, my head I was almost started hurting. 
reading about inflation and interest rates. Mm -hmm. how, how does all this stuff work together? So right now, um, interest rates, prior to this, interest rates have been held really low. So why did they bring rates down so low? Who's so, they? Uh, the Fed is part of that. The Federal Reserve. The Federal right? Reserve. And um, the other parts of the government that were buying mortgage-backed securities. Okay, So basically the idea is, is, is to, when you lower interest rates, that increases borrowing for consumers. When consumers can borrow money easily, mm -hmm. that funnels money into the economy, which stimulates growth. Gotcha. So the economy grows when the consumer is able to spend money and get into the economy. Now the economy is at a growth rate that we're <laughs> kind of aiming for. Okay, so right, the economy's right. growing, the economy's doing pretty good right now. It is. So the next fear on the horizon, if rates go nowhere, is inflation. So what does inflation mean? Inflation means that, um, let's say that $20,000 car in five years will cost 40000 That's if inflation is not dealt with. Well, well inflation's happening regardless. Infl but they want, they want to keep inflation to a decent rate, which is around 2%. So if it gets outside of that double-digit inflation like we had uh, many years ago um, is, is a huge problem and, and creates a lot of issues across many different uh, segments and industries. So uh, when rates rise, that has the same effect when, when you make it harder to borrow money. Okay. So there's less money in the economy. So it kind of, it, it doesn't, it kind of, they're trying to keep the economic growth at a certain level. Okay. So when those rates stay really low, then that's when that spurs activity. One thing I was going to ask you, though, is that, you know, we hear all the time about uh, the interest rate, you know, here on the nightly news, interest rates, the Fed raised interest rates today. Explain, that's not talking about the mortgage rate. Right. Let's be that, very clear. Yeah, yeah, that's a different rate. That's an overnight lending rate uh, between banks. Um, they don't necessarily correlate yeah, either. There, there's several rates. I mean, even like there's a 15-year fixed rate, a 30-year fixed rate, 10-year fixed rate. I mean, right. there's different... Uh, uh, there's different terms on these rates, but it, right. but they all kind of work together. So the Fed doing that to the, to the federal funds rate is now rippling into mortgage rates. Okay. And that's yeah, what we've gotcha. seen from January 1st. Rates have increased probably about a quarter of a point. Uh, the federal uh, Freddie Mac Mortgage Market Survey this past week showed 30-year average 30-year rates at 4.15. Average 15-year at 3.62. That 30 year is up about 10 basis points. So 15 is still really good though. 15 is still good. Um, but that's the highest since March of 2016. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, wow. That is, and that, that's an average too, right? Yes. That's yes. not the rate. So there are mm -hmm. lower rates out there. Right. But they did say December home sales confirmed that 2017 was the best year for new home sales in over a decade. Uh, it's incredible. And that's straight from freddiemac.com. So if you want to, when you say that, that, you say new homes, not new resale, home to be very clear. Difference between new homes, obviously, new, home new construction. Yes. And why so, is that, do you think? I think because there's a demand for um, new construction. We're going to get into some inventory numbers later. Uh, or, or matter of fact, we can go ahead and bring them up now. The uh, uh, Nationwide, there's a complete lack of inventory. Declined from for 31 consecutive months year over year. Wow! And at the current sales pace, the stock of homes for sale would be gone in 3.2 months. Yeah, that's. I mean, that, that, that's no houses. Just so you know, the that's to if we didn't have one more house hit the market, three months you'd be gone. I mean, there would not be a single house. Yeah, nothing on the for market. sale. Absolutely nothing for sale. So we've got a, a very. I'm glad you brought that up because it's a, it's really interesting right now. Uh, you know, we haven't had much rock in the boat in in the real estate world since the the demise, and I know that was almost two years ago, uh, the financial crisis. But now we've got really low inventory, mm, very, and we've got interest rates creeping up. Yeah. So we've got those two things don't work well together. So if you have buyers that are, or if you're a buyer looking to do something, now's the time. Yeah, now would be the time. Absolutely. So so what I'm thinking may happen is we've got. Um, Hold on. The question from Lisa is is you know, is that in all price ranges here in Birmingham? And it it really is, though, isn't it? Um, all price ranges as far in as terms the, of the inventory, inventory. Yeah, I mean, the inventory is a is a generic number which encompasses all price ranges. Um, you know, what we just don't have. I mean, hold on. You know, she is in Palm Beach. Yeah. Uh, our luxury is her 
average, probably, I, I would venture to say. I mean, you know, uh, pretty, you know, swanky house here for 500000 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, down there is, you know, living in the slums. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that inventory is going to be, um, you know, nationwide, uh, those numbers. And that's a kind of an average that I'm pulling off of that website. But, you know, what I want to say was, you know, these interest rates moving right now, you know, some of the stimulus was from the Fed. Um, mm-hmm. Some of it's from the growth. Uh, the GDP growth is, is obviously a number. Gross domestic product. Is, is a number. Now, 70% of that is made up of consumer spending. Wow, yep. yep. So you see how that works together where low interest rates get money to the consumer. They go out and spend it in the market. Okay. And that increases what our overall production in the country, which helps things. So the analogy I want to use is, is like with these rates moving, it's kind of like moving a cruise ship. And just to let you guys know, our next venture... Hey, I love cruising. You know, Collier and I, you know, we're just kind of... Right now, we're just warming up for our uh, the cruise ship videos. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this this will be yeah, happy yeah, hour. Yeah, we're, we're warming up for that. But, absolutely. but you know how long it might take a cruise ship to move, change direction? It's a long yeah, time. Yeah, change it's huge. Turn. So I think that's what we're going through. It's not going to be a, a real fast move and, and mm-hmm. everybody's guys falling, you know, hair on fire. But it, it's it never it's was here finally, though, was it? You know what I mean? It's finally turning the corner, and we're finally coming around. You're there. Awesome. So, um, so that's all. That's all. That's all. Well, we I mean, that. well, I mean, the the cruise ship analogy is true about the real estate market in general, right? It's not going to move. The, you know, one of the biggest scary things now that I'm seeing, though, in the if we want to talk finances and all that, is. Grant, I love the stock market and all those things. You want to talk about what can really deplete your finances? Putting that money that you have set aside for uh, a home and put it in an individual stock or trying to invest it to get a quick few more dollars, Yeah, don't do that. Right now, it's too volatile because I, I've had that question come up because they know I'm, I'm dabbling, uh, which is, uh, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's bad for you, I know, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and you know, just to <laughs> thank you, Amanda. We're gonna get those, uh, but just just to, and I don't want to get too far into this because I know a lot of people get turned off by some of this stuff. But you know, these these bond yields are going up. That's those are directly related to mortgage rates as well. So it's the long term bond yields that are going up. Now, when bond yields go up, they get more attractive, and when people buy bonds, that steals money from the stock market. So when money gets pulled out of the stock market and goes into bonds, obviously something's Tough. going to have to pull back, right? Something's going to have to change and give. So now, the good there is a silver lining to all this, which is if you're looking to sell, great time to sell. If you're looking to buy, good time to buy. But this isn't a sales pitch for you. It's just the truth. Yeah, and I, and I wanted to bring this up because I, I know there's plenty, plenty of people out there that can say I'm probably wrong. So now probably is a probability, okay? Now, there, there, there are experts on CNBC that are wrong every day. No. I'm not an expert on economic news. Huh? Okay? I'm you an to expert on doing mortgages. So if you say I'm probably wrong, you're, there's a good probability of that. So I'll just go ahead and get that out there. Yeah, this right, is right. Just, uh, these are just opinions. Uh, don't go to the bank. Don't, uh, don't, don't buy well, Apple uh, or, or sell, any, sell any shares of stock based on what we're saying, right? Well, don't sell them, but also don't go. Don't, the problem is what... I'm hearing people ask me is, should I borrow to get in the stock market? Should I, you know, all this crazy talk. And I'm like, this is right where we were before last time, right? And we don't want to do that. Be rational, common sense. Listen to Clark Howard. Uh, you know, yeah, that's gotta slow down and make, make good fin- still make good financial decisions. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with a good mutual fund anyway. Yeah. But let's let's talk yeah, let's about offers. You know, one of the biggest things, uh, and you and I talk about it all the time, is you know what can people do to strengthen their offers when they're writing that offer, so that in in a situation like we're in with very low inventory, you have to impress that seller in order to get your offer. Right, because accepted. you might have the, the seller might be looking at three or four. And how are, how do you go? Yeah. Hey, look at me. Yeah, exactly. Right? And you know, one of the first things that I wanted to talk about was being very clear on what you're asking for. There's nothing worse, and this is the difference between, in many ways, a good agent and a bad agent, and also you making ridiculous demands, which you know, you're know you going to be shocked that buyers would, right? 
Be very clear on what you're asking for. Tell the seller what you're asking. What are you wanting? Be very specific. Do you want the ottoman? Do you want, you know, uh, a new roof from the very beginning? Tell them these things. Now, yeah, don't and don't assume anything and, and have any surprises on the seller. I mean, how uncomfortable would that be? Absolutely. I mean, where does that in, make you end up, right? You know, and that's so it's being very clear and making sure that the it, proofread from that agent when you get it. Say, I want to be more clear than you already are. Yeah. Uh, with the terms, because sometimes I think. We leave too much open to chance, and um, uh, Julia is now talking to you, by the way. It says, my mom said Davy Wavy. Yes. All right. So anyway. Uh, Thank you, Julia. Write a letter. This has gotten, you know, I can count two transactions in the last yeah, year. Yeah, I was going to say cover letters. Cover letters are good, right? Yeah. And in fact, mom to mom works all the time. I mean, look, dudes to dudes, nah, we really don't care, <laughs> right? But mom to mom about how... How much you would love to raise your kid there, letting that seller know, yeah. hey, it was obvious. That heartfelt the, emotion, those those emotional ties. The stuff that I call silly. Oh yeah, works. yeah, yeah, like, exactly. You know, the void that I'm leaving in my wife's life that I should not, be doing. It may not. I need to do to a seller. It, would, it may not hit you the same way, obviously. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the pre-approval letter, right? There's two aspects to every transaction, almost, unless you're going USDA or some way that's 100% financing, which I, I obviously I don't like that because I want you to have some skin in the game long term. It just doesn't make sense to me. But not only do we submit these pre-approval letters, but proof of funds letter on top of that to prove that you have the money for the down payment. What makes a seller feel most comfortable is when they see that all bases are covered, that not only are they going to be able to get that mortgage, but are they going to have the down payment to go with it? Because we see it all the time yeah. when they don't. Yeah, and if you can get a guaranteed pre-approval, we could go ahead and look at your file and have an approval prior to submitting that offer. That means that we've got your income docs, we've got your assets, we've verified the cash to close, we have verified the income. You guys are good to go. You are At that point, you are the same as a cash buyer because you're walking in there, your loan's halfway done. Well, it, all we need to do is order the appraisal and, and move be on. very leery of a lot of these uh, internet banks. Uh, oh, instant approval! Really? You, you're telling me? Hold on, let's have a little chat. You're telling me they're not even going to look at you and offer you two hundred thousand dollars instant approval? That is the biggest bunch of malarkey. And then you got <laughs> some of these uh, big monster mega banks here, even in Birmingham, right? They go some of them. We won't list their names. Um, some of them like stagecoaches, but anyway, uh, uh, they they give you these convoluted approval letters that look very official because they have they have these fancy words written on it. Yeah, and I yes, yes, and I'll tell you, oh, it's crazy. You know, and they 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 don't they don't give you all the information, <laughs> and that really bugs me. I, I see Bill Matthews joining. I, how you doing, Bill? Oh, um, Ashton Gustafson. But you know, there, there's a lot calls? of there's a lot of stuff in marketing tactics. Yep. They drive me nuts. Like, for example, I looked up today, what percentage of loans are 30-year fixed? I don't know. What would you guess? Uh, 62. 85 to 90% of mortgages really? are 30-year fixed. Purchase mortgages. Huh. Okay? I now, I if you that. listen to the radio and they advertise a rate, what rate are they advertising? <laughs> like our net 2020. There you go. <laughs> what, what rate are they advertising? 10 and 15-year rates. That's right. You say, we're still doing loans at 3%. Well, they're 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 just kind of reeling you in. The same thing, same thing you're talking about. You've got to get all the information. But I'm I'm kind but, of but, an you, but, but I'm on a rocket. I'm, I'm a very, I can get a mortgage on a rocket. Yes, yes. Very, I mean, very analytical guy. So I, I'm, absolutely. I'm, I need Jay Day. Hey Jay. Everybody's going to shop the mortgage. I understand that. And that's but let's compare. Let's let's find. Let's get the real numbers and let's compare those. Absolutely, and, and I think too. Just because it looks official doesn't mean it is. Yeah. And if you're a seller, let's really dive deep and get your agent to get out there and really ask for approval and ask if they can speak to that loan officer. There's a lot of details that, that consumers miss, um, and there's a lot of salespeople out there that make it sound good. They tell you what what you want to hear, and you just got to be careful. Well, and the other thing too, especially with these loan officers of uh, these ones from uh, you know that, that run on rockets. They have rockets in their mortgages. Uh, they will be like 14 years old on an 800 number, and they know everything about buying a house. Well, they're just not as accountable 
um, to, to the real estate agent, the guys, the guy that you're in their car, you're in the realtor's car. Absolutely. Um, even if you don't use me, stay local because there you can go find that person if they screw your loan up. Yeah, if right. somebody's sitting in Wisconsin or they're sitting in Arizona, they do not load local customs, and that's our biggest problem with these out of town. They don't close on time. They never do. That these big monster uh, stage coaches, they never close on time either, right? And so it's a little tough. Now, one other thing I was going to tell you is, you know, uh, if you don't need closing costs, Larry Toth. Hey, go blue. Uh, if you don't need closing costs, don't ask for them, right? Because the seller only cares about one thing, and what's that? The bottom line. They do not care about anything else. They shouldn't. Sometimes they do. But yeah, and, and, yes, and I'll add to that. On the closing cost, when you ask for those, for some reason, it does confuse some sellers. So if you're if you're writing a contract for 200000 and you need 5000 in closing, that seller's getting one ninety five. Sometimes they don't do that math that quickly. If and don't ask for a them, percentage, by the way. If you way. offer yeah. them one ninety five with no closing costs, Brilliant. for some reason that's easier to understand. Absolutely. But, I, I, well, the problem is then you have the agent, uh, and you, and Jay Day says, uh, and you can never get an updated approval letter after hours or on weekends with those web based mortgage companies. That's true. That's true. You, I mean, it, yeah, it is. It's definitely hard. They're they're likely going to be a nine to five. But I'm in a but I'm in a multiple offer situation. And I true, must have that. True. Yeah. Guess what's happening? One of the great things, and this is just a story for David, is I called you one time in Maui. I don't know if you were Maui, Honolulu, where you were, and you answered the phone, actually. Yeah. Now, tell me this. If teenager at that mortgage company on a rocket, <laughs> do you think when he's clubbing, because he's going to be clubbing, you know, he's going to be clubbing, is he going to answer the phone at the club? No. Probably not. No. I mean... You're an old fuddy duddy, but yeah, I mean, so, I get that. So if right? it's after nine, I may be asleep. You might wake me up, but that's fine. That's fine. We can still we can still knock it out, right? Right. Well, I just need a letter. I mean, yeah. and that's that's one of the keys. It's just here. the updates, and and people run into problems. Okay, this process is sometimes stressful. Okay, Absolutely. you want to be able to get a hold of people, whether it's a phone call, an email, a text, whatever you want, and you want to feel like the person cares. Absolutely. You know, and the other thing would be re, be realistic on value. In a time where inventories are shrinking, we have got to be real on price. That seller knows what it is. If they got a good agent, they're going to have priced the property correctly. They're yes. not going to, they're going to list a good agent's going to price it to the market. And that's how we're going to get more money for their, uh, more money for their house. But also as a buyer, if you got to respect the idea that they have priced it correctly so that we can come to a meeting of the minds. So don't have this idea of lowballing. Remember, HGTV, take this. Everybody watches HGTV, and then they, they watch, what is it, House Hunters? Look, folks, House Hunters ain't real. They, there's three houses. Somebody's already bought the house, okay? They've already bought the house that goes ding-dong, and then they move in. They've already bought that house, okay? So it's not like that price didn't matter, Yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, and they lowballed them. Ooh, they lowballed them. No, they didn't. We don't know the terms, right? Nothing against HGTV, but but it's so ridiculous that I have people come and go. You know, it's worth three hundred. They go, well, let's offer two and see what happens. That ain't happening. And you're gonna really tick off the. It's hard to tick off a seller truly, but you got to be real when you're doing it and, and say. And then if you need to provide clarification of why you're making that offer, because you know one thing is if you can give them a reason, there's got to be a meeting of the minds. But you got to justify that number. And I think a lot of times the agents uh, need to do a better job. All agents need to do a better job. We all do at times of clarifying yeah, our client's some, position. I think sometimes those offers just don't make sense, and the seller knows that. Um, you know, it, that, that is sometimes things where they won't even come back and give you a counter because I think they, they, just, they just don't They think, turned you off. Yeah, they don't think you care at all. So you're not in a negotiation at that point if you go in that line. Well, you know, the other thing would be talking about cash offers. Right. Don't under overestimate the power of a cash, uh, the non-power or lack of thereof of a cash offer. Look, what did we say the seller cares about? The seller cares about their bottom line, how much they're walking with. What I can tell you is this: I don't care if you're using any of those crazy mortgage companies we talked about, or David, or any of these guys. They come with real green cash. It's the same to the seller. Now, now there's certain now, situations. Now the seller know the seller would know that the cash is going to be easier. 
Usually. Yeah, it's right? not going to have an you're, appraisal. You're, it's not going to have cert, uh, certain yeah. things that we normally go through. You don't through. have to deal with a loan officer that might have missed something. You don't have to deal with an appraisal. You don't have to Absolutely. deal with an underwriter. You, you have a, a, a buyer that if they're up front, they go to a bank and pull the money out and buy your house. So, sure, a cash, a cash offer is going to be more attractive and easier for the seller. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I mean, it's one of those things. You know, the other thing, too, is get your agent to really get to know the seller's situation so that you can write the offer to that situation. In other words, find out why they're moving or what they're hot button in, what's most important to that seller. And that goes in reverse, too, when you're responding to a buyer if you're a seller, is really getting to know, because if you can hit the right hot button and the right why, then, like for instance, I remember one time we had a seller, it was when the Curve TVs first came out, and this guy had waited all his life for this TV. <laughs> his wife finally authorized it, and he finally got it. And what did my buyer want to do? Take that man's TV. I mean, he, the man didn't ask for anything. As you know, Chris Rock says the only thing daddy gets is the big piece of chicken, right? <laughs> right. And his big piece of chicken was that TV. And he was ticked that his yeah. TV was getting taken. So be very careful on how we write the offer, right? Don't take daddy's big piece of chicken. Yeah. And Adrian, yeah. hey, there's Adrian Darby. She's the smartest yes. person I know, probably right there. But uh, so anyway, those are just some ideas, you know, uh, on, on strengthening that offer. I, I think it's real important for everybody involved. Well, and, and, and those are some good notes. Um, hopefully that helps everybody. Thinking about making offers, buying houses, uh, you know, kind of playing to the, to what the seller's looking to do, and 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 making a case for yourself in a multiple offer situation, which is what we're in right now. We have low inventory. It's a seller's market in most price probably, ranges. Wouldn't you say? Other than you know, up up over six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars, it's a buyer's market probably still. Absolutely. But, uh, for the most part, we're seeing a seller's market. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about was was uh, savings rates and some questions that I get from yep. borrowers a lot of times. You know, I pulled some numbers on these saving rates. Um, and it, it was really, really hard to, uh, I guess, just startling statistics. Um, the median retirement account. Okay, so let me, let me back up. So right now, the latest survey says 29% of Americans have above $1,000 in savings. Huh. So that 29%. means 75, seven, what's that, 70%? 71%? 71% have less than $1,000 in savings. It's easy to get over $1,000, I would think. Yes. Well, we don't That's spend what we don't have. Now, when we go back to what, what we were talking about earlier on with the uh, consumer spending. Now, one of the things, we've got some tax breaks coming in. So right. are those consumer spending cash or are they borrowing credit? Well, okay. that's right. That's so right. That goes back, goes back to that point. But anyway, so... Uh, the. I was also interested in the median retirement income. So when you're looking at retirement and funding retirement accounts, um, I would say overall we're, we're probably not doing a great job at that. So I, I did some numbers. The average savings, um, households between the age of 50 and 55, the average is 124000 That they have saved, totally. That they have saved. The median, okay? Right. So the difference between the right. average and the median, the median is the middle. The average is the average. So when you have super savers, okay, they're going to skew the average. The super savers are going to skew that. Well, right, that guy you all know. We yeah, all know. Yeah. So the super savers skewing the average. So the median is only eight thousand. Wow. Eight thousand dollars median in retirement accounts between fifty and fifty-five. Okay. So that's troubling. Now I did some other numbers. If you're to retire at sixty-five with four thousand dollars a month. What you would need in there at? Did you say sixty-five? Yeah, you're retiring at sixty-five right. right now. You're fifty-five, right. and at retirement you want four thousand dollars a month. Right now you would need nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars in there. So that means on average we're eight hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Well, short. I was a matter of fact, I was listening to Clark Howard today. He was saying he wants to see twenty-five times your current salary. Twenty-five times your current salary. Yeah. In order to retire at the same level. Right. Now, that's the same level. But what he's talking about, and you say 25 times, and you know, his because I did, I said 25 times. What you going back to what you talked about at the top of the show, which was inflation. Yes. You, you can't bank on this dollar being worth what it's worth tomorrow. And this idea of early retirement for most people, get it out of your system, folks. It's not happening unless you have done 
I mean, not only extremely well, but you've saved the money yeah. and you have it ready to go invest. Okay. okay, so let's think about this. So let's think about um, our, our millennials right now buying houses. Right. Okay. Yep. yep. So what if the millennials, instead of looking at 20% down, okay. the ones that are, what if they doubled their 401k contributions and put less money down? That's kind of where I'm going. Instead of instead of worrying so much, and, and that's one of the benefits of mortgage insurance. People hate it, well, right? People it, people people think it's terrible, but it allows you to get into a house with less money down. So maybe you divert some of that money that you would be making on a mortgage. Right. Maybe divert your four hundred one k and let it sit there for twenty thirty years. Yeah, and 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 make more. A larger payment on well, and that's the one thing. It's that, just it, these are just ideas. And let's talk about that. That brings up a good question. Talking about the four hundred one k borrowing to for the down payment. Uh, you know, I'm not a big proponent of borrowing from the four hundred one k because I think the problem is, oh yeah, well you're repaying yourself, all that. The problem is, there's too much that can happen, and you're meddling with your future, right? I that's mean, true. Yeah, you're pulling money out that should be making money for you. If it's your only option, because I love the idea. Okay, I pay it back interest, sure, sure. But yeah, yeah. I'm now paying for myself, right? Now, which if, is not if, the same as growth, by the way. Yeah, if it's your only option, there's ways to look at appreciation. Yeah, and uh, th- th- there's several numbers. Interest rates rising. You know, there's mm. several f- factors that go into break even analysis. Whatever, does it make sense? For the most part, probably not. Probably better to leave that money in there, and let it make money for you, rather than pulling it out. Absolutely. I mean, we're, and we're going to hear more about this. Is, is, is one of the interesting things that's going to happen, I think, is, as we go along over the next year, is that with so many more people making money in the market, guess what? They went from having nothing in that 401k, making America great again, got us to where they actually have money for a down payment in that 401k. So then they're going to come back. We had it in the run up yeah. where people were, oh, I got to pull it out for uh, that. Remember, it's your retirement, folks. And one of the best things, too, is that if you ever have a, a real estate professional of any kind, whether it be mortgage thing, that, that doesn't cautiously run into those options and say, well, let's hold on. Let's make sure you're probably with the wrong person because I think that it's of such importance to the future. I'd much rather you have a future than a home right now. Yeah, some yeah. There's a lot of situations where people need Thanks, to man. rethink. And uh, one of the and, one of the great rehabbers, Dad, he he sells a good home, Matthew Gregory. Well, you know, also had a couple of questions that you that come up a lot uh, from borrowers that I wanted to cover. One of them is uh, when do we lock in rates? So that's a great question. You so know, when people, do we lock in rates? People might call and get pre qualified. They haven't looked at properties yet, so um, they want to know: are, is my rate going to change? So what we have to have is a borrower, uh, a property, and a closing date. Hey, Brittany! A borrower closing and a proper, uh, property. So the closing date tells me how long I've got to lock it in. Okay, so obviously, again, with rates moving, if I've got to lock it for 180 days, okay, it's going to be different than if I have to lock it for only 30 days because the bank's committing to that rate. So if I lock you in for 180 days, the bank's saying, I'm going to give you that rate in 180 days, but they're not sure what rates are going to do, so right. sometimes those rates are a little bit higher for a longer rate, uh, a longer rate lock. Well, no, no, but the rate lock. You know, the funny thing is, we hear from buyers saying all the time, "Can I, can I lock in my rate for a hundred days?" Like, like they're not even ready to buy. Yeah, yeah, when, we got it. And, and the rate stays. The rate lock stays with that property. So if if that property falls through, then the rate lock's gone. Then we find a new house. So if we, we don't find do the house, again. we can't lock. So that's look, man. That was a nugget. That's awesome. When you lock, you lock to a property. Yeah. Not a thing because a lot of people got, go. I'm you, looking. Let the me lock. You got borrower, the property, and and the closing date. And they all have to. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. All those things. Um, next one was I have a contract. What do I do now? All right. So what do you do? After the contract, the first couple of things are going to be, now we're assuming we're pre-qualified, pre-approved, everything's yeah. good. We're going to do the home inspection. So I want to talk about home inspection versus home uh, the appraisal. The home inspection is kind of identifies huge problems with the property, okay? Or or gives you updates on on how old things might be, what working home inspection, order, the home inspection, yeah. what working order are things, what kind of repairs am I looking at, what am I going right. to need to do, um, what may break soon, Um you know the home inspector does it gets pretty detailed into their analysis of the property 
I, I can think of maybe some other inspections that go along with that, like Chinese drywall, septic tank systems. Um, what else do people look uh, at out there? You're talking, you're talking about separate from that? Just, yeah, the, just inspections well, you in general. Termite, you got, I mean, you have the occasional Chinese drywall. We don't see that much anymore. Yeah. But. So, so that's, that's the home inspection piece. Now, once you are, it, that means you have kind of, well, like, like a doctor, you have analyzed that property pretty well. All right, you've had somebody do it. They gave you the information. That's right. You've analyzed the property pretty well, and you say, you know what? I still want to buy it. Mm -hmm. Then that's when we go with the appraisal. The appraisal is an opinion of value. Okay. Okay. A lot of people get upset with these. Well, okay? but, but, but one of the problems that Obama did was he instituted and made them almost inspectors as well, which really, I want to be very clear, if you're getting VA, FHA, those, those have now become quasi inspectors and we including when we list a house now we give them a list and say hey look I don't care if it passes inspection you get to the appraiser he's gonna be looking at these things and so talk about that as well because yeah there's there, there's a certain number of things but that but that really has gotten to safety and sanitary I'm talking about broken glass exposed electrical wires loose toilet uh, yeah I mean, big things, uh, uh, handrails, not on decks, uh, decks coming apart from the house. I mean, these are things that are safety issues that Lead definitely paint. should there be caught. Yes, definitely should be caught by the, the home inspector. Um, but, but I just want to say the, the appraisal is a opinion, subjective opinion of value. Hey, don't take offense. So, so there might be a house that's worth 360000 Okay, you got it under contract for 340. Mm -hmm. So the appraiser might come in at 340. That shouldn't upset anybody. You, you still might be able to sell it for 360. <laughs> That's funny because we do see that, don't we? But it happens all the time. And borrowers Absolutely. Get, buyers get upset with that. Uh, it, it's, it's just an opinion of value. We really just need it to make sure that the bank is lending money on a good asset. So if, if, we wanted, if we're saying we're lending money on a $340,000 asset, we want to make sure the asset's worth 340000 so it's not really nothing. It's, it's nothing that you need to take personal if it doesn't come. Oh, out. oh, people don't take it personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they take it personal every yeah. time. Yes. I mean, the biggest question yeah, too. And, and the other thing too is that if it if the appraisal comes in high and you're the seller, don't get ticked. That oh my gosh, I left eight. Uh, let's say eighty thousand on the table. You didn't leave eighty thousand again. It was a very subjective. It's a market. Uh, but, a, but a market's a buyer and seller. So you found <laughs> yeah, a absolutely. buyer that was willing to pay your price, and y'all made absolutely. a deal. At that, after that, you know the appraiser is just making sure it's really for the lender, just to make sure that that we again that we're that and we're one, covered. On one the thing asset. I wanted to let everybody know too on the appraisal end of it is that I, I believe it was during Obama. We also had a situation where they a added some rules regarding making sure you guys didn't know who the appraiser was yeah, now. until afterwards. So don't get mad at your lender right away because they did not. They picked a, a group of 10 say, yeah, and, and we, then one selected. Yeah, we've got a lot less contact with the appraisers. Um, oh, there's Mitchell Miller. Yep. I haven't yeah, seen absolutely. him in a while. Uh, yeah, Mitchell. Yeah, yeah. Mitchell. Thanks for tuning in. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, the appraisal... You know, and, and I just wanted to kind of clear up some of the questions about the difference between yeah. that home inspection and the appraisal. A lot of times after the home inspection, you'll have repair requests. You'll take them back to your realtor collier. He'll take them to the seller. You guys will negotiate, make sure the seller might be willing to do some things. You know, and then we move on to the appraisal. So absolutely, the appraisal is also an expense. Okay, yeah, talk about that because because you do pay that up front, correct? Yeah, we but do. it's credited to you on the. Settlement well, well we, we, yes. Uh, for, for the most part, a lot of times we'll get a credit card authorization, but we won't. That's most charge, lenders these days, right? We won't charge right? the fee until uh, yep. um, until closing. So that just makes sure that if something, if for some reason the loan doesn't close, then Mitchell. we can still pay for the uh, appraisal. But but it is an expense to the buyer that we are going to incur as soon as we order that appraisal. So we want to make sure you're happy with the home inspection first. Right, right. Well, and that and two. One thing is. Make sure your agent, one of the biggest places that you can, your agent can cost you money is by telling that lender you're done with the inspection when you're not really done with the inspection. Make sure you're done because if, if you're not satisfied with it and that lender orders that appraisal, a lender may hold you responsible for that $450, right? Yes. Yeah. Because it was actually paid out to the So that's uh, why a lot appraisal. of times we, we talk to the borrower and the real estate agent uh, 
about that mm -hmm. home inspection, make sure we're through that phase before we move on with that appraisal and, <laughs> and ultimately the mortgage. So process. you're smart to ask again to the agent, yeah, I know you told me, but are you done? I know you told me, but what'd you tell me? What'd you tell me? That's right, that's right. Um, and, and, and talking, going back to that in inspection, y'all really don't have a part of the inspection. Let's be very clear on that. Y'all are more involved only on the appraisal, because you order the appraisal. And then if there's a problem, what happens? We get notified. A lot of times, y'all don't even get notified before we do as the agents, and they ask us, hey, what am I missing here when there's yeah. a problem? Yeah, uh, most, most of the issues on appraisals will be subject to, we'll get an appraisal back to subject to repairs. So there's certain things that are, are just glaring yep. issues with the house that the appraiser says, you know what, I can't really put my report and this value on this property without you fixing the handrail or without you, uh, FHA a lot of times will see scrape, scrape the peeling paint and repaint it. <laughs> scrape the peeling paint. Everybody has scraped the peeling yeah. paint. Now, now another example, uh, this is a pretty easy one, but on new construction, you know, we might order the appraisal and the house is, uh, 90% done. Okay. So obviously there's things that still left to be left to do. So the appraiser will say this is subject to completion of the house. And then we send them back out gotcha. to finish that up. So the, those are a few things where the appraisal comes back with, with a subject to the only other thing on the appraisal that usually causes problems is value. Sometimes yep. the value is not covered. Um, and then, then we go back to the listing agent, the, the buyer's agent, and we ask for more, uh, comparables, additional, homes that they saw out there in the market that got them to the value well, they listed it. And one thing that we've done, you know, in 2011, it was a pivotal year for our team. And one of the reasons it was, I mean, we saw sales go from here to here. I mean, it was a rocket ship, but not that kind, same kind as that mortgage company has, yeah. but a different rocket, uh, was two things. Professional photography on every listing. Every listing got the best photographer in town. And then the other piece was a pre-listing appraisal, encouraging it, encouraging yeah. a seller to get a pre-listing appraisal. Why? Why is that so important? It's important because we get it priced right from the very beginning. We take the, the worry from you guys mm -hmm. completely out of the equation. Yeah. If we take it out of the equation, then we don't have to... Then we, then we don't have to worry about it and we're priced right from the beginning. And not only that, one of the best things that a pre-listing appraisal does for you is that when, you know, what is it Dave Ramsey says? Not a big fan of Dave Ramsey, by the way. I mean, I'm a, actually, I'm a fan of Dave Ramsey's systems, not a fan of the dude, right? But that's okay, that's a different story. But, uh, where was I going with this? I'm not sure. I'm not a fan of Dave Ramsey. I'm not a fan not. of Dave Ramsey. Oh, I know what it is. They, they, in every relationship, <laughs> there is a nerd and a free spirit, right? A husband and a wife, okay. right? And so that nerd, usually the man, is going to say, hey, it'll never appraise. But when you have that pre-listing appraisal and you can go, here you go, hot shot, right? How do you like this? Here's this pre-listing appraisal. Yeah. Look, and not only that, I can't tell you how many times we've been able to walk in and say, uh, here's the pre list. How would you like 20000 of equity to a buyer? And they go, how can you guarantee that? I said, well, because we've listed it at 260000 We got an appraisal saying it's 280000 If you give me full price, you got 20000 of real equity. Yeah. Uh, now, it's again, the, he said it earlier. The appraisal is only one man's opinion. I get that. But it, they're using formulas. Um, that are, uh, let's say, formulas that... It's, it's a very educated guess. Yes, there you go. I mean, they, they want to be conservative. They, they don't want to go crazy. And the, a lot of times you have very similar homes in the area that they, can, that they can make this easy. There are definitely areas that have different homes, different price ranges, uh, different uh, uh, like swimming pools, hot tubs. Absolutely. Uh, screened in porch. Uh, golf courses, you know, I'll, there are some things that may be hard to price or may be hard for them to assign a value to. But for the most part, it's a very educated guess. Uh, and they're, they're, a lot of times they don't go crazy over the purchase price because that's all we have to cover. And Stephanie Miller's joining us. Great decorator, Divine Floors over in Hoover. She yes. is amazing. She knows her stuff. She's actually got style. She knew Revere Pewter before Revere Pewter was the color of the year. 
There's no question. <laughs> She's Mrs. Revere. I, I, actually, you know what? She may not be Revere Peter, but she had Revere Peter on her list. But uh, I forget. But man. Oh, and Christy Bass is watching. Hey. It's good to see her. Christy Bass. Hope Joe and Josh were doing good. Hey, that's good. Yeah. So what right. else we got? We got. We're going to talk about. Uh, let's say Mitchell Miller said, if the buyer pays for the appraisal, can they request that the title search is done first, or does the title insurance cover the cost of the appraisal if issues come up? If the buyer pays for the appraisal, mm. I mean, you can request that the title search is done first, so you don't have any issues with the title. Uh, but the title insurance is not going to cover the cost of the appraisal. Yeah, they're they're not. No. One thing about title insurance, Mitchell, is that they don't like paying claims, uh, and they rarely actually pay physical money. What they do is they they what they call insure over claims, right? So they like well, they to, will cover it, but well, they won't. Yeah, but for the most part, you just want to make sure that the title is clear to the property. Yeah. That there's no encumbrances or liens. Um, Absolutely. So. That's what the title insurance is for. So nobody can come back and say, "Hey, they, you know, the previous buyer owed me four hundred thousand dollars. So since they didn't pay me, I leaned the property, and now you owe me." Absolutely. Um, well, so we're, we're going to get into different things. We're going to get into the fun part now. We get at, I get asked this question a lot. Everybody knows if I know I know real estate very well, but I know how to get a deal, right? I mean, I'm Mister Deal. I love deals. I love being cheap. Hang around Mark Carlisle long enough, you know. You gonna be to go, He had to go walk through Lowe's to download Facebook. I mean, I mean come on. Look, you want to talk about how cheap the guy is? The guy has a brain tumor, right? He's talking about himself. No, no, I'm talking about Mark okay, Carlisle. Okay. The guy is is so cheap, right? I'm he, sorry, he I'm has sorry a, Mark. Yeah, he has a brain tumor, and he might have been to Brookwood Hospital. It sits up on a mountain, and there's a Target that is down here, way down the mountain. They offer free parking at Target, so Mark decides. It's going to cost him three dollars to park up there, so he parks at Target and walks up the hill each way. All this with a brain tumor. I'm just saying. Hey, hey, what works? What works for so him? So tell us about the Southwest. Yeah, he, he has a new car and I don't. There you go. Uh, anyway, uh, Southwest. One of the best things that uh, Amanda and I have done, my wife Amanda, is over the last uh, five years, I think, we've flown buy one, get one, essentially. We've had the Southwest Companion Pass. Anybody see it there? And folks are asking me all the time, what's the easiest way to get the Companion Pass? Uh, the easiest way to do it is to play the credit card game. Now, I know we're funny. We were talking earlier about, oh, we're so conservative on our, on our finances and everything. And I'm telling you, go get a credit card, right? But what I'm going to tell you to do is you get the... Southwest Airlines credit card that's for personal that'll give you fifty to sixty thousand miles. Then you make the minimum spend, which is usually two thousand dollars, and then you go and get the business card. You can do it in reverse, right? If you don't have a business, just make up a dog walking service, they don't care. And then you get that, and they'll give you another fifty or sixty once you hit those. Once you hit a hundred and ten thousand sky miles or not sky miles. Fortean slip. I hate Delta, by the way. Hate them with a passion. Uh, miles are worth their junk. They're worth very little. Um, once you hit 110,000 miles, they'll, they'll send you this companion pass. The companion pass is good for basically a companion to fly with you, whether you pay with award miles or whether you pay with money. Uh, however you're flying, that a companion flies free with you as long as you're on the plane. I can't tell you, it has saved us literally thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, folks are asking me all the time, hey, hey, Mr. Drummond, you know, like from different strokes, they think I'm Mr. Drummond. Yeah. But I'm not Mr. Drummond. I'm just thrifty. And what ends up happening, though, is that you actually get to travel a little bit more. You, you can take that extra trip, and you really don't care. So if the trip's $500, well, it's 500 for two people, right? And so it goes for all of that year and all of the next year. So if I got it in January of this year. I'd be able to roll it over to all of next year. So if anybody has questions about that, email me or or, or ask a question yeah. here. I'll be glad to go over it with you. In later shows, we're going to go over my spreadsheet because I have a killer spreadsheet. Well, any any other questions right now before we sign off? I think we've uh, pretty much covered everything. We ran a little bit long today, but uh, but it was good. A lot of information. Um, I know that uh, the Super Bowl has had had an effect on the. Uh, mortgage business in Philadelphia, at least. I think I, I read 
that there were borrowers taking out 30-year cash-out refinances to buy travel tickets, <laughs> uh, packages to the game. But one borrower's response to that, he said, the, the Eagles only make the Super Bowl once every 30 years. So, of course, it makes sense to take out a 30-year loan. <laughs> Maybe he's right. <laughs> on that note, know. on that note, we'll see you next Thursday at 4 o'clock-ish. Next Thursday. Next Thursday. And we'll, we'll try to be on time, and eventually we will get this thing dialed in. And uh, Absolutely. It's Thanks, be a Mark. Good product. And uh, Mark Wood, that is. Thank you, Mark. And, uh, you know, by the way, I'm picking the Eagles. On the money line, they went outright. Tom Brady. He's a cheater. He's a winner. He's a deflator. See you guys next week. Bye, Cassie. See you. Bye. Hold on. See you. See you, Cassie.